Welcome to my video. Today's colors are Hansa Yellow Light, Naphtal Red, Ultramarine Blue, Burnt Sienna, Yellow Ochre, Ivory Black, Titanium White, and Liquin is the medium. I'm painting on an 11 by 14 panel, which has already been pre-toned with Burnt Sienna. I'm taking the liquid and now I'm making my dark mixture of ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. Today's painting is a beach scene that uh, I'm using from from memory. And this is a number 6 hog bristle brush made by Princeton, the Ashley line. And so I'm going to take a few minutes now and sketch in a potential scene. Some people will make a no tan, which is just a, a black and white drawing on a little piece of paper or a notepad. But I prefer just to sketch right away onto the panel. And if I do make a mistake, I can always erase it with a little bit of my gam saw which is odorless mineral spirits, which I'm using as a, basically my paint thinner today. There's a, a cliff that's going to be on this side. So I'm just sketching in these big shapes. Mindful of uh, the fact that that's going to be my darkest area. And over here ways, we're going to put a little couple of rocks to draw attention. Over here now is going to be where we'll see the horizon line, which in today's painting is going to be the edge of the water. And over here you'll see I'm, I'm making a, a place for a little pool of additional water. Perhaps it got trapped with high tide in this little low area here. It's our imagination we can we can do as we wish. Now I'm adding some more ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. This is going to produce our darkest dark today. So here I'm not really trying to, to do too much. I'm just concentrating on covering the canvas with paint. And of course this cliff area, like I mentioned, is going to be the darkest area in the painting. So this will become my darkest dark. No need to really focus on detail at this point. That will come later. However, I am thinking about some variations, even in the cliff, in these darkest darks. And I'll leave those alone uh, with just the underpainting showing. So that way, it will give me a kind of a map on where some of those areas will be. If you have a limited space studio, like I do, a French easel makes perfect sense. French easels can handle very large paintings as well as very small. 
while there are a number of other more expensive options on the markets today for artists, especially those that like to do studio work as well as outdoor work or plein air work, I still think the French easel is hard to beat. The French easel is very weighty though. They weigh about 13 to 14 pounds empty. But they have plenty of space to hold all your paints, all your paintbrushes. And the painting itself can be carried right here on the on the shelf that's provided. The only thing that doesn't fit in my kit when I go out plein air painting is the paper towels and then the mineral spirits. I have an additional cloth bag that I will take with me and I put those items in it. Most of the time I paint not too far from the car so that way I do not have to lug this gear a great distance. One advantage of a French easel though is they're very sturdy. You won't have any problems, at least I've never had one blow over on me. Whereas some of the newer models are the Peshad boxes with the tripod configuration I have had problems with. And a French easel, once you get the hang of it, isn't that difficult to set up. And it really does provide a very secure painting place. And like I said, it doubles as a studio easel for those of us that have smaller areas to paint in at home. Now here, uh, what I've done is just add a little bit of titanium white to the mixture. And if you squint, you can tell that there's just a slight variation. It's still the same tonal value as the dark that I put on. But it does give us a little bit of variety in this larger shape mass. As I was saying with the French easel, there are a couple of compartments inside the French easel that are also handy. The Maybath full box easel that I'm using is lined with tin so that way it also protects the wood from any oozing oils or medium spills. Comes with a, a nice size, I think it's about a 12 by 16 wooden pallet which you'll see me holding up every once in a while to show you the mixtures. And then I have a small medium uh, canister which will fit the liquid in. I also bring with me oh, what do we call it? a bungee cord, a small bungee cord and I put that through the paper towels and then I can just hang that right off of my easel. I also find that uh, if you're planning uh, e either in studio or outside, it's the same setup I, I practice, so that way I'm used to setting up exactly the same regardless of the location. I will take a couple of uh, paper clips, basically, the, the larger uh, clips that you, you see sometimes in the uh, stationary, uh, you can buy them in any stationary area in uh, the big box stores, and take a couple of uh, just the small grocery bags plastic bags that unfortunately don't get to very recycle very much but at least I try to um, use those for my trash by clipping them to a portion of my French easel so that way uh, when I'm outdoors at least I have a place I can uh, collect all the uh, the dirty paper towels that I might use into that bag and then I then they're ready for disposal here I'm uh, taking some uh, yellow ochre as you can see here And then I'm putting some ultramarine blue into this mixture. Tempting to get a kind of aqua green at this point. And sorry, sometimes with this palette, you don't always see everything that I'm doing on it, but hopefully you, you get the idea there. There you can kind of see the, the green color that I'm coming up with. And sometimes it'll take a little while to to mix the color that you're really shooting for and, and you should take your time 
until you get just the right color that you want to put on your painting. Too often, if you get into a rush, you will put the wrong color on. And although it doesn't have to be an exact match, what we're trying to do, though, is at least come up with something that's in a mid-range value that we can use uh, highlights on, uh, whether darker or lighter, in subsequent passes of paint. Right now, of course, uh, most artists would call this the block-in stage. So we're just continuing to concentrate on getting some basic shapes and colors on the canvas and cover it, because until we do that, it, it becomes very difficult to really judge our values because everything is you know, lighter or darker in comparison to the other colors that we're painting on on our surfaces. I am trying to vary the brush strokes a little bit, as you can tell. And here I'm also just showing you um, why am I showing you that? Well, I'm, obviously I'm cleaning my brush with the paper towel, but um, sometimes um, we can spend way too much time attempting to clean our brushes with mineral spirits, whether we're in the studio or outdoors painting, and it's really not that necessary. As long as you're using a paper towel, you can get most of the color off. And, um, you know, certainly we don't want a lot of mud developing if, if we're using too many dirty brushes but if you uh, a little hint if you if you take your dry brush and you dip it into the liquid first and then dip it into the color that will help at least at, as you start a, a particular color mixture that will help another um, trick that can help you is to set aside just a couple of brushes for your lighter colors and a couple of brushes for your darker colors and then make sure that you're using your particular brushes for the darks and uh, go for the other uh, clean brushes for your light mixtures and this will also save you some time and help you with the cleaning process without creating a bunch of mud on the canvas of course mud is just <laughs> perhaps another word for for um, not so saturated color and a lot of um, a lot of that mud can actually be used for uh, good painting so don't don't get in the habit of thinking that uh, you can have different colors on your brush but uh, if, if you want some some crisp delineations between your colors uh, this is one way that that will help is by making sure to use just a couple of brushes for the light colors and a couple of brushes for your dark colors and of course uh, one of the ways that you can judge the values and the tones is by remembering to squint constantly uh, now, in this case, I'm, I'm painting for my imagination, so I, I, there would be no need to squint. But um, even, even here, though, actually, I will sometimes get back away from it and squint to see if the, uh, the colors look about what they should be in terms of the lights and the darks. And especially if you're, if you're painting from some kind of a reference, whether it be uh, outdoors especially, as when you're going to be squinting to see different color shapes. And of course, with photos, that's a whole new game. Um, you have to always remember that photos. Ho hopefully, you can kind of make some mental notes as you as you make your photo references of a, a place that you visited. Always use your own photos, and then uh, realize that most of the time it is going to give you your darks are going to be too dark in photos, and your lights are going to be too light. And uh, remember to see that there are different shades, different colors in your darks just as they are in the lights. And sometimes with photos, they blow them out, uh, either too dark or too light. Obviously here, this is a little bit lighter shade of the beach that I'm putting in. And as you can tell, I did switch a brush to, to my brush that's going to be primarily lighter colors. And notice, uh, even with a, a large brush, and I would encourage you, uh, notice this is a, 
I think this is an eight now. I predominantly painted this painting with a, an eight, a size eight uh, flat brush and a size six flat brush. Try to create your paintings with the biggest brush you possibly can use. This will help you cover the canvas quickly. And notice that you can get some very small shapes with the edge, the tip of the brush, like I'm doing here, even with larger brushes. So don't begin a painting with a, a number two brush by all means. You don't need a very small brush. Um, sometimes we get fooled in thinking, well, that's how you get detail, right? Is using smaller brushes. Well, you may want a small, what we call a liner brush or a rigger brush. I have a number two that I carry with me, but that's really all that I use for some smaller shapes. I, I can get plenty of, of different uh, variety of strokes with, with even a large brush. And hold off on using your small liner brushes until, until you get to the highlight stage. Now here, I just wanted to take a moment while this color was on my brush to introduce a few extra places on the cliff where I could see some sunlight having some effect. Also, remember to, to work the, the painting all at once. In other words, uh, what we call a la prima, all at once. And I'm not trying to get too detailed in any one section of the painting or try to finish any one section of the painting before I have applied the, uh, the block in for, for the whole entire canvas. Here, putting some titanium white. Creating a mixture. That contains ultramarine blue. As we look at the, the two major areas that are still uncovered with paint at this point. things to remember is to get more detail or certain shapes you're actually cutting one color into the other so as I put this blue in I'm also being conscious of the fact that I'm also affecting the shape of these rocks and so by cutting into what I've already put down in the darks I can give some shape and life to these rocks to walk away from the painting for just a second take a look at it from a distance it's always a good practice to get into even if you enjoy sitting and painting get up take a break get a drink of water come back to it now here I've added a little bit of the Hansa yellow light into that mixture to create a, a more of an aqua color as we get closer to, to working with some of the waves. I wanted to change that color a bit as I got away from it. It was a little bit too close to a blue 
that's going to become the sky. And so we need to make sure that the water is can be differentiated from the sky color. I don't have the sky color in yet, but I've done enough painting to know that it was a little too close to the mixture that I will be using for the sky. And when you see me cross the uh, picture plane like that, uh, that's when I'm, I've got that uh, paper towel uh, stringed onto the French easel, like I mentioned with the bungee cord. And so I just, uh, it's very convenient though to be able to, uh, to just bend down there and to pull off a couple of sheets like I need and, and continue painting from my, from my position. And then, uh, although you can't really see it on this shot, because I want to make sure that you can see every stroke on the painting itself, um, the palette here, I, I'm all, uh, most most of the time, um, unless I, if I was standing, I, of course I would be holding this all the time, but, but when I'm in the sitting position, I, I basically just lay the palette right on the open uh, front drawer of the French easel. It makes a nice table. You'll note with my palette, uh, I use a rather limited palette of colors with Hansi yellow and with the Naftal red and the ultramarine blue. Those are the, the highly saturated colors on my palette today. I do vary my color palettes once in a while. And then I use some earth tones. There are some artists that, that don't use many earth tones. I use uh, burnt sienna, yellow ochre, and a little bit of ivory black, although I must admit that I keep putting that on the palette, but I, I hardly ever use it. But especially burnt, uh, yes, burnt sienna and the yellow ochre I find to be very, very good at uh, just being convenience colors. This way I don't have to try to mix those colors, which you could from, from an even more limited palette. Uh, you can create those by just basically putting together your three primaries and, and shifting the, the various uh, amounts of paint to, to get different tones. But I like this setup very well in these colors in particular because like with the burnt sienna and the yellow ochre, well, those are really inexpensive colors. Uh, you go pricing your tubes of paint. And to me, that just makes sense to have those two colors on your palette because they are cheaper, they are um, uh, colors that that are not as um, saturated, which which go well for your darks, and then that way you don't have to spend more time and more effort and more money by using your really saturated colors, which usually cost a little bit more money um, to to go ahead and make those those uh, those other additional colors. So to me, it just makes a lot of sense. Now here you can see that there's definitely a tonal difference between that sky and the water. But I don't want there to be a hard line out there at the horizon line. Otherwise that's going to it's just going to look funny. When you stand on the beach and you look out, what you often see is not particularly a line, but areas where you can't hardly tell which is which and so notice here as I'm flicking that brush gently up and down and mixing those two colors into one another that creates a sort of illusion of, of not necessarily being able to see that that line as clearly and that's what I want especially today there's going to be kind of a little bit of an atmosphere maybe some rain out there uh, off the coast. I have always been impressed by some of the uh, painters that um, always had a lot of atmosphere in their skies and not just not just a plain blue sky. And so if you noticed in many of my works I enjoy putting some clouds in, some some possibilities, some, some rain uh, some kind of dramatic action happening, even though the uh, sky is not 
usually the focal point of my paintings, I think that this adds interest for the viewer. And here you can clearly see as I'm putting this, this is titanium white, by the way, with a little bit of Hansa yellow in it. When you're making your clouds, you don't want to use a titanium white straight out of the tube. Uh, your, your clouds will not look very natural and it'll create a very cold looking painting. So you, you need to warm up the temperature of your clouds. And so that's what I'm doing here. There are little places that I do want a little bit of that underpainting to show up there in the sky. And so I'm leaving a little bit of that orange uh, shining through. So and you can kind of see that in those streaks in the clouds at this point. So some of those are, are still going to remain. Now here I'm just uh, cleaning off the paintbrush uh, just enough. Uh, and then uh, now I've got uh, a clean fan brush. No paint on it. And uh, making sure that it's completely clean is what I'm doing now. And now I'm going to go back in and help to eliminate some of those edges. To soften those edges. And so now I'm just kind of practicing and then just very lightly touching the canvas where that paint is. Uh, I don't want to obliterate it. And that can be one mistake that that you can make with the fan brush is that if you, if you really attack the painting with it you can obliterate what you just put down uh, focus on the edges of those shapes that you put down and and lightly uh, just lightly flick at it and you will you will soften the edges without destroying the color that you put down for the for the, uh, the clouds so I'm barely touching the canvas in those areas right now but notice the effect I'm getting is, is what I want a, a very soft soft clouds today and now um, every once in a while I'll clean off the fan brush because it's picking up all those colors And once again, I'm dipping that into the Gamsol Mineral Spirits, cleaning it off, and now uh, reaching for for my light brush. On to another mixture of color, starting with uh, some titanium white. And here... Once again, it's it's good at, at certain levels. I've I've now I'm realizing that I've covered the whole canvas, and so it's important right here to step back, to take a good look, to to do some squinting. Are my values correct? And I can see that I'm I'm happy with the values at this point. Still a far far cry from a finished painting yet, but we're getting there. And this is actually for the for the waves, the waves are going to be the lightest color on here. So this is straight titanium white, which is the, and then using some of the colors that are already on the, um, the painting surface to mix with it. And you'll notice that with the, with the waves, this may not seem like it's making any sense right now. I'm just putting down this white color. but I'm, I'm using various strokes here. Some that were horizontal, but most of them are vertical strokes. Thinking about how the tops of the waves come on to the sand with some drama and movement. Here I'm cutting away some of the cliff that I had painted earlier so that I can have a more of a, a contrast to these rocks that are in the front those brown shapes in front of the waves so these waves are hitting the back of these rocks once again yeah I'm, I'm using my imagination but I'm also remembering my experience of being at the beach And now 
I'm just softening some of the tops of these waves. So there'll be going to be some areas that are a little bit crisper than others. And of course, with waves, uh, you, you don't see that there are going to be places that are, are much wider than others. And so I wanted to obliterate uh, that uh, part a little bit so that way it, it didn't look like there was some kind of just white line across the, the painting. And of course, now I'm, I'm thinking um, just with some light little strokes of this fan brush's tip of how that water is hitting the rocks and effectively coming over top of them. And so trying to be as careful as I can uh, and hopefully still have this read correctly that you can tell that uh, there are places where this, this water is, is really coming up quite high, splashing on these rocks, and, and then also uh, creating some water that's getting stuck here in this little pool area that's actually on the beach. And I think you've all experienced that before, right, where, where there may be um, a little shallow pool of water that's been created and kind of left by the high tide that's still there. And that's the effect I'm trying to go for. Now I'm using the um, the fan brush to to suggest where that water is going, and that uh, it's a little bit thinner at this area, uh, picking up more light at the very top of that little pool of water. And here I'm using that same color to suggest areas of the sand where it's a little drier or wetter than others. So. give a sense of of some differentiation of colors in the sand itself. Once again, get up, walk around, see what it's looking at a distance. Now I'm creating a little bit more of this aqua blue and I'm going to go color back into that white and some of the other colors here to create a sense that this is water coming towards the beach and so there are going to be places that are going to be a little darker out there on the tops of some of the waves maybe out from the shoreline just a little bit just to give you the sense that there's there's some depth and and some some real real strong waves coming into this section I was quite happy with these darker sections notice so uh, just with a few little lines uh, some some horizontal strokes a couple of vertical strokes that uh, already you can I think we're getting a sense that that there's some real drama happening out there off right off of the beach and now I'm going to come in with a few more vertical strokes on the front of these waves and think about the wave as it comes in there's certainly areas that look very white with the foam but there are also areas that you can almost see right into the wave right and so that's what I'm working on here with a few of these strokes There we're coming up a little bit with the sand. Working on just a few few other variations. Of 
course where there is dry sand there's going to be some sand that's a little bit wetter and so I've added a few of those strokes so at this point I'm relatively happy with how the painting is coming along I think that your eye is filling in some of the areas of detail that need to be filled in without me having to do that for you. The rock there, the yeah, this is a, a gamble. You'll notice that that rock is almost in the very center of the painting, but it is clearly the focal point as well, where the waves are coming into this beach. There's some other areas of interest, the pool of water that hopefully is, is serving as a way to take the viewer into the painting. Uh, certain aspects of this cliff I'm going to hopefully give us enough detail at uh, later on as we continue painting uh, to provide a little bit of uh, wonderment here and interest, but uh, clearly it's going to be in that very center area around that that smaller rock where the water is, is coming on to the beach and hitting it from the back side and then, and then spilling over top. Here, uh, this is a little bit darker mixture of a, a green. There was some, I'm, I'm envisioning some green on this, this cliff. More of an algae type green, not, not like a, a grass green here, but uh, oftentimes, even even at uh, various locations around the beach, you will see this uh, pigment on some of the cliffs, and some algae growing on some of the cliff cliffs that uh, don't don't see as much water. You might have some something green on the very tip top of this of this cliff. So we're just suggesting that there might be a little bit more to look at there and and it certainly seemed like it needed some of the, the these darker greens to complement the um, the aqua green that we see in the water it certainly lends itself I think to what we would call color harmony to have various places around the painting using some similar colors most of the time you do not want to have one stroke or two of, of one particular color that just kind of screams for attention and so this is kind of a subdued color palette even though I've got all those colors on there you notice that it's it's a very very low contrast today in terms of the greens and browns is mainly what we have here I had mixed up this orange thinking that I wanted to to try something um wasn't quite happy with the mixture and so now I'm darkening it using all three primaries and it will become a little bit of a color that I'm going to put on the cliffs various rocks and so forth various places where some light is hitting just to give it a little bit of color, a little bit of interest in some of these areas that that were predominantly so brown. You might think of it as a, a small accent color. And of course, the danger is that you get uh, carried away and put too much color into it. And so here, even now, I was tempted to do a little bit more and then decided that, no, I need to just... Uh, keep it uh, relatively subdued and uh, wanted to once again this is a way to call a little bit more attention to the focal point notice that the the orange color that I just put is where all the drama of this painting is near that uh, getting your eye focused in on that uh, those rock formations where the, the water is hitting
by the way as I'm just uh, working on a few little details some rocks and things that uh, will break up some of the sand color for just a minute some some of you have asked questions about what what equipment I'm using to create these videos and you might be astounded I, I use for the shooting of the footage an iPhone SE second generation but does a, a fine job I think and then I am porting it over to a Chromebook believe it or not this is a, a Chromebook that has an Intel Core i3 processor latest generation with LumaFusion as the program I edit it on I do the voiceover on and then I send it up to the cloud and one of the reasons I, I have this type of equipment is to see how few resources I actually need to do this and so if you are thinking about getting into some kind of YouTube channel doing your own stuff um, keep in mind that it, it, you don't have to spend a, a ton of money I was able to get the um, this particular Chromebook laptop only cost maybe three hundred dollars and it has the Intor Intel Core i3 which was the minimum processor you can have to utilize the LumaFusion and it does have a 128 gigabyte hard drive on this Chromebook so I was able to um, store the videos here at least on, and then move them over to uh, an external drive once I've completed the whole process of putting this up on YouTube by the way you might be thinking well how can you get the iTunes uh, I, iPhone uh, videos uh, working well with a Chromebook well uh, I store it up on iCloud and I can access my iCloud from my web browser and then all I have to do is is it's a very simple process to download from my iCloud account onto the hard drive of this com uh, laptop computer and then get it into LumaFusion where I can do my editing and then send it back up to the YouTube channel and then archive it onto my external drive rather than to try to fool with connecting my iPhone to the computer and transferring it to the computer uh, you, you don't have to do that many steps just just use your Chrome browser go to iCloud directly and uh, you'll see all your photos all your videos right there it does mean that you have to have I, an iCloud account and uh, be able to work from from the cloud with your your iPhone but this is a pretty simple and very cheap way of doing it because the SE model of the iPhone is is usually the cheapest model available or and, and like I said this is a, a somewhat dated model uh, an SE2 and uh, like I said this is a an HP Chromebook that's not particularly great but it does have the core i3 processor which enables me to do it now here you notice that I've added the details as I've been talking to you to suggest a little bit more of these waves and a few colors in uh, the larger sand areas just to give it a little bit of a, a visual variety and uh, all of that is is basically helping to point towards the focal point area now here is where I screw up honestly I screw up I'm I'm trying to soften these images on the uh, cliff and I ultimately don't like what I end up doing Now here's just a very cheap little brush. I think I picked this up at like a Walmart store for, you know, in a, one of those bundles. Uh, it's got synthetic fibers, but they're very soft. And, and so what I use with this cheap brush is the ability to take a little bit of paint 
and to put it over top of my other layers without disturbing them too much. Uh, at one point I thought about just leaving that cliff like this, but uh, I'm glad I didn't. It, what, what happens sometimes is you end up, you'll obliterate some of your darkest darks by attempting to paint into it some lighter colors. And that's pretty much what I did here. And um, sometimes what happens too is that you, you think that you've got the painting just about done and you'll set it aside for a little bit. And that's what I do here. You'll see, uh, I'll tell you when the break occurs and I will come back to the painting and actually fix one area, which is uh, this area on the cliff that I, I was not happy with in the first sitting for this, this painting. I didn't let it sit like overnight or anything. I mean, like I took a 30 minute break <laughs> and then came back and and reestablished darks in that cliff, which I th I think, well, I know I'm, I was happy with, with the final result in comparison to what, what you see right now on the canvas. Here again, just trying to soften some edges and put some variety into a couple places that I thought need a little bit more detail. I think pretty soon here you're going to see me pull out what, what they call an eraser. It's got a, a hard rubber edge which I'll use to sign my name into the painting. <laughs> now since we've got all the cliff uh, area going on on the right side, I felt like in this case I was going to sign on the left side so that it helps uh, balance out the painting a little bit. In other words, we don't want everything of, uh, going on on the, the one side of the painting and not the other. Now here's where I thought that the painting was done as you see me stand up and I'm looking at it from a distance. I've already signed it and thought it was good enough. But here, <laughs> there you just saw a little bit of a, a blurb. And, and so now I'm going back into this uh, cliff and I'm going to do a few touch-ups and reintroduce the darks. And you will find over time that this, this happens quite often. In fact, when you start with the darkest darks and you build on to it, when you get near to the end of the painting, sometimes you have to repaint the darks because you've sort of obliterated them by putting other lighter tones and shades on top of them for, for accents and highlights. So, so now I'm just thinking about the cliff that I saw and introducing some darker darks into that area that I was not happy with. It kind of looked like uh, it was unfinished. <laughs> or at least that, that's exactly what my wife said when she saw the first version. She said, it looks unfinished. And I wanted to argue with her and say, oh, no, it's not. It, it, it's perfect. It's fine. And then I got to thinking about it and looking at it and saying, no, she's right. This cliff is not quite right. It needs some darker, darker tones, some different shapes to provide a little bit more interest a little bit more realism it just can look like a blob and we don't we don't want a blob we want a we want a nice cliff with some texture of course with some areas where there might be some rocks sticking out from the, the plane we want it to kind of feel three-dimensional And so now I'm just kind of playing with it, seeing what looks good, introducing a few. And, and I actually do want to preserve a few of the lighter um, tones, but certainly not, not like I had before. Creating some edge work so that your mind can put in there that uh, these are rocks where nothing's growing, or there's little ledges at the very top of these rocks, where there could be some sand that's been blown up there, but but not not nearly like we had before. 
Now you've noticed I have um, actually haven't asked you to do much, but uh, as the video is coming to a close here, you could really assist me if you wouldn't mind uh, subscribing to the channel if you like the content. Subscribe and then give a thumbs up if you like the video. And I imagine if you if you've watched to this point in time, uh, I would imagine you you've liked the video. So if you could give a thumbs up, that would be wonderful. And if you got a comment or two, or if you've got a subject matter that you would like me to paint in the future, um, make a comment or two in the space below, and I would be happy to um, to answer your questions and to listen to some of your feedback. Now, if you're going to be just cantankerous and and want to um, you know tear tear me down or whatever. Uh, please note that I'm not going to I'm not going to put your comments on there. But if you're respectful and you're asking serious questions, uh, I, I certainly will answer you in as quick a time as I possibly can. And if you like my uh, paintings, by all means, these are available for sale. Uh, this one's still for sale, I think. At the well, obviously, <laughs> I'm doing the voiceover um, about a week or two after I've I painted this painting, so. Um, that that's why I mentioned that. But uh, I have a a website. You can go to davidwpo.com, and um, from there you can you can um, there's a link to uh, purchase my paintings. I'm also developing a Patreon site. So if you'd like to support my artwork in the future, you can go to my Patreon page and. There are like three levels of support. I think it's like $5 a month, $10 a month, $15 a month. Which over the course of time, when you think about how much some of the other artists charge for their painting videos, oftentimes in the hundreds of dollar range, I'm giving you tons of videos for about the same price. So if you sign up for a Patreon, uh, that you're really you're really helping me there. Uh, I will have more videos coming on the Patreon page. I uh, most of the content's going to be very similar on YouTube as well as in Patreon because I want to make sure that this is accessible to as wide an audience as possible. And so, so basically, there's not a lot of perks on the Patreon page other than the fact that you're allowing it to allowing me to make this content. Uh, pretty much free of charge to anyone that wants it. And by your uh, financial support, that that enables me to do that. So, something to consider. Not everyone needs to consider that, but uh, it's available if you wish. And like I said, um, I don't have all the kinks worked out in the Patreon page yet. Uh, just search for me under the my name, and eventually I'm going to be putting all of this information in the uh, descriptions of these videos on the YouTube channel so that way you can look at the links in the description and that will take you right to the Patreon page and to my website and other offerings that I might have. Here again I'm just uh, adding now a few details into the scenery. Here I'm, I'm much happier about the cliff and uh, finishing up some of the foreground just adding a little bit of variety. Sometimes, you know, you do, really don't want large patches of of paint where there's where there's not much happening, not, not much variety going on. And so, just on a, a beach, you just there's always uh, a few rocks and shells, different colors. Uh, could be even a, a crab or two. And so. You notice a few specks of of these darker colors that I've I've added into the uh, the beach sand scene. And notice too, it's at this stage where you want to be careful that you don't overdo it and uh, take your time. Uh, the painting process really slows down after you get the block in stage. And. Um, you want to make sure that every stroke really, really counts and it's a 
contributing towards the whole rather than um, taking away from it. And it doesn't take long to, to ruin a painting if you continue to overwork it. So here I'm just putting a few highlights on the top of, of some of these rocks to show a little bit of depth. And that would be where uh, the sun would shine the most is on those little ledges. So just about done now with the, the painting. So I want to thank you for for watching the video today. If you liked it again, uh, hopefully you'll subscribe. You can also share it. You can also paint this for yourself. And then again, uh, you can go to my website if you'd like to, to purchase any of my paintings. I'm very reasonable at this point. I'm just beginning my career. I didn't start painting until I was almost 50 years old, and so I'm uh, 54 at this point. So thank you so much again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.